If we take a moment to analyze mankind and human civilization, we will notice that there is a unique evolutionary hereditary trait within us all. And what I am referring to is curiosity. It is curiosity that creates the spark within us all to discover, create, understand and progress forward as a species. Curiosity then is akin to the fire of the gods, the titan Prometheus stole from Mount Olympus and gave to mankind to enable their evolution and the progression of civilization. The theft of fire for the benefit of humanity is a reoccurring mythological theme. Various myths, countries, cultures and systems tell a story of fire theft. The Native American tribes, the Rig Veda book Recovery of Fire, the Book of Enoch, wherein the fallen angels teach humanity to use sorcery, tools and fire, including countless other myths too. This is no mere coincidence, actually the more you progress, you'll realize there is no such thing as a coincidence. This illuminating spiritual fire is akin to the profound light of Lucifer, the light bringer. Although a devil, he casts light into darkness, the great unknown. Once the shadows of ignorance are banished by that brilliant light, the labyrinth into the self and simultaneously the great beyond is then illuminated. Guided we are by the torch of Lucifer, the Promethean fire, or these sorts of otherworldly archetypes, yet we are byproducts of our own ego. Whether or not we admit this is redundant. No matter how shrouded in ego we are or become, curiosity will in some degree be present. For as long as we can trace back, our ancestors looked all around them with a burning curiosity and that curiosity would lead to obsession. This primal urge to discover is what drove us as a species so far, yet these days not all of us are like our ancestors. The spark of curiosity hasn't disappeared yet, it has diluted because we have selected a few in our society to discover for us or even lead us rather than do the work ourselves. In this modern age, we get caught up and distracted by media, gossip, politics and other tedious things like video games and movies. Our ancestors didn't have these sorts of distractions at all. Instead of their eyes being attached to smartphones or television, their eyes would look up into the cosmic heavens, around them analyzing the organisms and the materials and all that was present. Mathematics, astronomy, geography, agriculture, and so on was born, until these systems then progressed leading to the scientific systems we use in our modern day life now. Whilst I do agree we should continue to strive to know more about our physical world, it should be known that the majority of our reality isn't physical at all. All things that we perceive are merely an illusion, one which we fabricate ourselves unknowingly. All external impressions are being distilled into the mind then broken up and assimilated so to speak. In order for us to engage with our reality in a way which is more suitable for our kind. I once would say that reality was deceiving, yet in actuality I have come to learn it is our mind, our perception and the actual self that is the greatest deceiver here. There are many out there that would dispute this and believe that our perception is actually very accurate yet not entirely perfect with the odd illusions that may occur now and then. Yet anyone with real understanding of perception beyond the confines and borders of external senses and physicality, nothing is real, and therefore all things are permitted. To your average person, who would never take up these rites or spiritual sciences, these powers, intelligences, forces and spirits are not real at all. Yet to the magician, who thrust themselves into the systems completely, and immerse themselves with a theory, not only are these things real, they become overwhelmingly real to the ritual operator. All things existing in a quantum light soup state, before your eyes look upon them, it is a mesh of pure randomness and form formlessness. It is when you gaze upon it, when you observe and perceive it, that in that moment that thing takes on true actual form. The idea of reality being an illusion, a dream or simulation isn't a new thing at all. It isn't a result of mumbo jumbo spouted by warlocks, magicians or witches. 
In actuality, some most intellectual minds in the field of theoretical physics have quite, com have quite often commented a marvel at the strangeness of our world. They have seen how objective or subjective it is. They have used their logic, and even their logic have led them to conclusions of this world being an illusion that only takes on real form when it's observed. As we alter our perception then, the entire thing that we are observing can also alter entirely. To truly and fully cause such alterations, we must let go of logical and analytical ways of observation and thinking. I know I and many of us in this path wish that we knew all of this in the very beginning, not just having books full of rituals and sigils. Remember, there is no God that is coming to save you. There is no angelic saviour that comes to correct the world of evil and injustice. It is up to you to either liberate yourself or damn yourself, to empower yourself or destroy yourself. Religion can only take you so far. Oneness yogic systems of spirituality can only take you so far. It is in my absolute honest opinion that practical and applicable spirituality is the true scepter to power. The power in the path of black magic specifically is one which delivers onto the operator an overwhelming amount of power that he slash she is unprepared for. Thus, it leads the possibility of leading to instability. In all honesty, when I opened the gateway to these forces, spirits and powers many, many moons ago, I never truly understood the magnitude of what I was immersing myself into. If one does have a well-established foundation of will, stability and common sense, one can stand the chance of facing the storm. There are, however, many that come to the left-hand path because they are already unstable, and yet this only seems to worsen their instability. They live in a world of pure fantasy, performing rituals and spells just for the sake of doing it, accumulating so-called power and assuming a desired embodiment of all things that, quite frankly, they are not. Let's use a theoretical metaphor here to explain this. Let's imagine a teenage boy, and he gets into black magic. Let's say he's awkward, he's not confident around the opposite sex, and is somewhat cowardly and suffers from a lack of a spine. This young boy then may learn methods to summon entities forth that embody and convey all these qualities that quite frankly he just doesn't have, invoking and siphoning these qualities from the spirit and distilling them into the fiber of his being. Whilst this is fine, there is a choice to be made at this point. Do they act upon the recent transformation and change their actions, thoughts and deeds? If so, then they have done a positive and quite great thing here. Yet the most likely outcome is that the teenage boy will sit in his bedroom which he calls a temple, he will close his eyes and visualize a weak body that he has is now muscular and gigantic. He will have an imagined image of himself. He will sit with a new sense of gain power and will. Quite frankly, he is just escaping into a realm of pure fantasy. And when he goes to school the next day, he may still ignore the opposite sex. He may avoid confrontation with bullies because of fear. He will just go back to his regular self. This will lead to a very serious case of mental and emotional instability, wherein these rituals and spells are no longer the realm of magic. They become his imaginary world, a realm of fantasy to which he can escape his surroundings and harsh truths. I myself have met many individuals that start off like this, and eventually they become frustrated, then angry, and then begin to hate everything. They then take the title of an anti-cosmic practitioner, who just hates for the sake of hating, leading them down a sinister path, until they are trapped in a cycle of powerlessness hate and instability. This path is one where we can create real change and drastic alterations within us, others, and the world, and all the worlds. If you've tried and cannot seem to get anywhere with magic, well I am glad that you have clicked on this video. This will attempt at conveying all that you need to know before diving into rituals, to give you a look into the mechanics of how this all functions really. The Harsh Truth of Magic Here in this section I must be entirely honest with you, and even myself. Magic isn't like Hollywood. Calling forth a spirit and asking him to bring wealth doesn't 
mean you can just sit and wait for an instantaneous materialization of money falling from thin air. It doesn't work that way. The fact is, if you did such a right, you would need avenues through which the force, the energy, spirit or power can work through. If one was jobless, had no business contacts or any contacts whatsoever and was a sluggish, unambitious, lethargic individual, it would be rather difficult for them to manifest a goal at all. Let's use another theoretical metaphor here. Let's say you perform love magic in order to manipulate someone to fall in love with you. Firstly, do you have a good friendship or any sort of bond with the individual? Do you communicate often? Are there any individuals close to that target who would stand in opposition to your intent? Would they convince the target to not fall for you? All these things should be taken into consideration before such a magical undertaking. I have met people who have only gotten into magic because of loneliness, desperation and insecurity. They feel they need to manipulate someone to fall in love with them. Okay, let's say that's the case, which is fine. But if done incorrectly, most of these rites end in failure. There are many reasons why this would happen. For example, I once knew a man trying to manipulate a woman to fall madly in love with him. When in actuality, they barely had any form of contact outside of the few daily text messages or sometimes calls. If she, however, had any sort of true emotional residue towards him, even if it was only a basic friendship, that residue would be easily intensified through magical means. This woman was also friends with many different men and women that were extremely different to this magician and his lifestyle. They were a lively bunch that would celebrate and would frequently party and go out in groups. In that group were many men already close to her that wanted more than friendship, believe me. They didn't like the magician and they knew if he got into a relationship with her, things would alter greatly. Ergo, they would probably do everything to prevent such a thing. Large groups of friends, partying, intoxication, carnal fascination amongst the group, that's a big obstacle. This magician I knew was angry and demanded to know why the magic he had performed had not worked at all. Here, he should have removed or altered the obstacles and barriers in front of him, as well as intensify the relationship between him and the target. He could have started off as a friend, gaining trust and actually infiltrating the actual friend group, to which he could have then used magic to sway the group to actually like him and be more inclined to actually aid him in his endeavours of initiating a relationship with the actual target. At this point, there would be avenues created through this and the barriers would have definitely been torn down. After some patience, the group would learn to accept him as one of their own. They would probably speak positively of him and highly of him if magic were used to make them succumb to his magical charm. The target would also have feelings of happiness, excitement, compassion, empathy and various other positive emotions common amongst friends, at which point he can now retreat into a circle, perform the magic on both the group and her, whether separately or individually, it doesn't matter. And this would lead to the target's friendly feelings towards the magician to become more intense, slowly becoming best friends, then someone to confide in. Other emotions would then stir attraction, lust, romantic feelings leading towards complete surrender, and then love. Yet, many magicians till this day still think that magic is like in the movies, in works of fiction. Instead of taking this approach, the magician told the magician told me what he did, and I immediately interjected and told him it was sure to fail, and it did. He instead performed the ritual, kept liking her pictures, sending messages, double checking his notifications, worrying and doubting and becoming frustrated. After this, he would continue to message and come on a little too strongly because he assumed that with the powers of magic behind him, the pendulum of fate would surely swing his way. Yet it did not. Her friends would message him on her behalf and state that she was busy, which only validated my theory of them being influences over the situation. After about two or three weeks, he opened up to her, to which then she blocked him and ignored him on social media. At this point, he became extremely frustrated and would actually speak poorly of the spirits that he called on to help him on this task, calling them useless and blamed them for the failure of the outcome. I assured him that these spirits are very real 
but they need to act in the laws within our world. There, are, there need to be avenues and routes for which they can work through. He would shrug it off and continue to use these demonic kings as scapegoats for his own failure, which is never a good idea. I stated that if he was not willing to do such intricate physical work in his mundane life along with the rituals, that it would be better to perform a general love rite. To bring forth the ideal partner that he was looking for, I thought there was no way he could screw this up. And yet he did. What he did next made me roll my eyes and sigh in frustration, and it dawned on me. All of this was futile. He began giving me a list of a woman he wanted. She had to have brown hair, large, perfect, symmetrical breasts, an hourglass figure, tan skin, or someone who was ethnic and exotic, one who possessed specific outlooks, beliefs, and so on. He was basically acting like a teenager, trying to build his ideal woman in an imaginary lab. He also wanted one that would travel the world with him, one who would be completely devoted to him. As I explained to him, this once again isn't a general right to bring love into your life, and the odds of him finding a woman like this was slim to none. He also then stated she needed to be perfectly healthy and fit, and that if possible, he would like for her to be Canadian or American, and have a citizenship. After listening to this drivel for so long, I immediately interjected again, and wished him luck, and left him to it. He would continue his endeavours with many obstacles and barriers in place, with no avenues whatsoever, constantly reaching out to me, stating he wants me to curse these women for not falling in love with him, to which I immediately stated that I would not. I knew I couldn't get him to change his approach, and to stop slandering the names of the demons and the ancient beings he was calling on. And now years later, I have grown, and he is still in the same vicious cycle, a loop of futile spells with no way for the materialization to occur. With this in mind, we understand that in this world there are limitations. In the astral plane and other realms, we can instantly think of something and manifest it there and then. This realm isn't like that. There are ways through which we can alter this reality, yet if the self is not prepared, if the correct approach isn't taken, these aren't avenues, <laughs> then you have no avenues, and that is idiotic. So you have to be open-minded, step outside of the box, but then further, step outside of yourself, outside of your own ideas. For example, I believe in science to the degree because a lot of it is spot on because I've experienced it. But I cannot base my entire idea of the universe on laws of physics alone. I step outside even the beliefs I have. I step outside all the mental charter, entering into a disassociated state is then required, which some will call a trance. This is to then blur out of this physical world, or at least our sense of it. To then harness in one or more non-physical, spiritual, and what some call psychic senses, Imagination is then the key, with real power behind it. Leave yourself open and don't question it. Be in a moment and do the goddamn ritual. If there are avenues for this magic to work through, then most definitely it will work. If you go to pick something up off a table, you wouldn't overthink it, right? You just, you just wouldn't. You wouldn't analyze the needed biological movements to achieve the feat or the gripping technique that you will use, or will calculate the speed and the distance between you and the item you're picking up. No, you wouldn't. You would just pick the damn thing up. It's that simple. Our magic can be that simple. It's just we overcomplicate it. We overanalyze it. It's just been shrouded in mystery and fables and secret societies. And these things at one time were required. There were times witches used to write in made up languages or codes so they wouldn't be found practicing magic. The time for that is over. Magic is a spiritual science, yes, but one that is calculated and measured through experience alone, not test tubes, machines, mathematics, and other systems of analysis. Magic works within avenues, within common sense. Be logical, but also at the same time, step out of logic. And that is the paradox of magic. I hope you've enjoyed this. And I hope this opens your mind with new clarity.